live from Brooklyn. It's Monday night. <laughs> and I'd love to introduce the crew to you. First off, we have from Columbus, Ohio, Mr. Donald Culp. Hello, everybody. And then from Nashville, Tennessee, we have Mr. John Tudor. Yes, sir. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. And then we come back to Brooklyn, where I'm still dodging bullets. And the car horn. <laughs> oh. oh, wow. Um, John, you want to open this up with a word of prayer? Sure. Father, Lord Jesus, we just thank you this evening, gracious Father, for your love and your great tenderness to us. Thank you that we can gather around your word and be blessed by words that edify and lift us up and build us up and give us a future and a hope for our lives. Thank you that we can grasp onto them and just see the reality in them and just make them our own. So thank you for the teaching tonight and for the fellowship in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, Don, would you like to go ahead and just start? All righty. Very good. Well, my name is Don Culp. I am a truth seeker with the Living Truth Fellowship, tltf.org. And we seek the truth in the truth because the Bible says thy word is truth. That's what Jesus said. And the truth will set you free. And freedom is something we all like. And we all strive for, and uh, knowing God and knowing His Word gets us closer to knowing what God's heart is. Yes, God has a heart, and David is a follow is a fellow in the Old Testament who uh, had the heart of God. Uh, so, uh, want to talk about David a little bit tonight and uh, see what we can learn from him. In Acts 13 and in verse 20, we start reading a little bit. And you can scroll up there, Donald. I'll read what you got. Uh, Acts 13, verse 20. And in verse 20, let's see. All right. All this took about 450 years. Okay, that's how long the judges. Uh, Paul is actually giving a little talk here, and he's reciting a little history, talking about the Israelites, how they got out of Egypt, and then there was judges, and then in verse 20, it says, And after this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel, the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, and he ruled 40 years. And after removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. And where did, he, where did the verse go? Okay. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. That's a quote from God, from his word. He will do everything I want him to do. Wow. Is that cool or what? So that's what Paul said uh, via Revelation and uh, talked about what God thought of uh, David. Uh, in the Bible, in Romans, I didn't give you this verse, but in Romans 15 and in verse 4, it says that what sort of things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Uh, that we, through patient and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. It also says in 1 Corinthians 10 that the Old Testament uh, information about the Israelites and all those guys was given to us as an example so that we wouldn't be ignorant of all those things and so that we could learn from their mistakes or learn from their successes. And David certainly had many successes, and he had many failures. So we can learn a lot from David. And uh, one of the things about David 
because he had the heart of God. Uh, he was a man after God's own heart. Uh, he became king, and his descendants uh, were Joseph and Mary. <laughs> Is that something cool? Did you know that? Yeah, in Matthew chapter 1, uh, in Matthew chapter 1, it talks about the uh, bloodline of David and how it ends up with Mary. Uh, and in verse, which verse did I want? Uh, verse 6, 1 verse 6, it says, And Jesse, the father of King David, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been your eyes wife. So this bloodline goes from David through Solomon all the way to Mary. Okay. And, uh, some people think it goes through uh, Solomon to Joseph, but uh, there is uh, teachings on our webpage about this, and we believe that this is uh, Mary's bloodline from David through his one of his sons, Solomon. And uh, Joseph is also of the lineage of David, and we see that in Luke. And in Luke chapter 3 and in verse 31, we, we pick up the lineage. And 3.31, it says the son, where to go? The, there we go. The son of Malia, the son of Mena, the son of whoever that is, the son of Nathan the son of David, the son of Jesse. So this bloodline is from Jesse to David and to David's son, Nathan. Not Solomon, but another son, Nathan. And this is the bloodline of Joseph. And Joseph is the legal father of Jesus Christ, uh, who he legally adopted as his son. Uh, a whole lot of interesting reading on that topic as well so david is a direct uh, descendant or jesus christ is a direct descendant of jesus christ uh, david's uh, heart had a lot to do with how he thought uh, how he uh, viewed things uh, when we talk about the heart of a person, uh, we're not talking about their their uh, thoughts necessarily, but we're talking about the their deep innermost thoughts, the things that you really believe or that really uh, make you do this or cause you to act a certain way or or why you do this or why you do that, those things all come from the heart. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Uh, not necessarily as a man thinketh is he, but as a man thinketh in his heart. So thoughts come to us all the time, good thoughts, bad thoughts. But we, what we have to do, according to the, the New Testament, uh, is we are to take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we want to, when we hear thoughts, we want to run them through the filter of the word. <clears throat> Keep the ones that agree with the word. Kick out the ones that don't agree with the words. And then let them, and then chew on them and meditate on them and let them become a part of us in, in our innermost part, the innermost part of your mind. I like to think of it like a popsicle with a tootsie roll in the middle. The popsicle is your mind. Uh, thoughts are all these uh, licks that are coming after it, but the real chewy car caramel center, chocolatey center, the good part in the middle is the tootsie roll. And that would be like the heart. That's the real heart. So that's one way to visualize the mind is you get this, the mind where all your thoughts come, but the heart is the innermost it's like the icing inside the cupcake or inside the donut. Uh, that's the heart, the real guts of your mind, so to speak. But anyway, God declared David a man after his own heart. 
very, very cool. So we uh, believe that's a good thing. And I think God did too, because uh, we're going to read a little bit about that. And uh, we'll go from here to Genesis chapter 6. I want to show you that God has a heart too. And uh, that's how we can be and have a heart like God. Uh, in Genesis chapter 6, and in verse 5, Genesis 6, 5, it says, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart, the innermost part of their mind, was only evil all the time. Oh, man. That's bad. That's nasty. Only evil all the time. Whew. That's that's a, a evil we have not seen in this our day and time, I don't believe. Uh, <clears throat> then in verse 6 it says, The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth. That's how bad it was. In his heart, God's heart was deeply troubled. So God has a heart. Uh and it aches just like ours aches, and it has pain just like ours does, uh, and for a lot of the same kind of reasons. Uh, but uh, the Word of God uh, is basically the heart of God in writing. Uh, we know that the we're familiar with the phrase, the Word of God is the will of God. Well, it's the will, a person's will is is their heart, what you really want. That's, you know, and God wants all kinds of good things for us. He wants us to be in health above all things. He wants us to prosper and be in health. Uh, he doesn't want us to be sick. He wants us to be uh, more than conquerors in every situation. Uh, these are things that God wants for us. It's his will. It's his heart. Uh, the, uh, but to, to get to David, we want to go to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10. Let's start right there. 1 Samuel chapter 10. And in 1 Samuel chapter 10, we're going to read in verse 9 a little bit about Saul, David's predecessor. Saul was the first king of Israel. Uh, they had judges for 450 years, and then they decided they want to have a king like all the other nations. And God said, that's probably not a good idea, but if you want one, I'll give you one. So... As Saul turned to leave Samuel in verse 9, God changed Saul's heart. And all these signs were fulfilled that day. All, a whole bunch of things Samuel said came to pass about Saul. And Saul changed his heart. His motives were changed. He had the Spirit of God on him. Uh, and his motivations and what drove him in, that, in, a, in his heart took him in a different direction. And he became uh, the king of Israel. And he was the king. He reigned for 40 years, according to the New Testament. Uh, and uh, he had some successes. He was trying to, his, his goal was to wipe out the Philistines who were the leftover Nephilim on the planet. And that's why they were so, I don't know, feared, they were odd, weird, uh, not natural, um, an aberrant race of people designed specifically to wipe out the nation of Israel, basically. That's what the Nephilim were. Okay. Um, <coughs> In 1 Samuel 13, we'll start reading there a little bit. 
was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel 42 years. Now that uh, version is kind of a later rendition of that verse. The King James Version says it a little differently, and it says, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, he chose 3,000 men. So according to the King James Version, which would be a little more word-for-word uh, -word translation, uh, the things that followed verse 1 occurred during the second year of his reign. Uh, and he only reigned 40 years. 42 years contradicts Acts 13. And so that's what makes us think that the NIV is a little off on this particular translation. But anyways, we believe that Saul, during his second year of reign, chose 3,000 men from Israel, 2,000 were with him at Michmash, and so on and so forth, and they became uh, embattled with the Philistines. Then if we jump down to... Uh, verse 8, is that where I want to go? Yeah, basically war was near. And in verse 5, the Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand of the seashore. They had a lot of guys. And verse 6, when the Israelites saw that their situation had become critical, in other words, they were uh, apparently being outnumbered uh, seriously. Their army was hard-pressed. They hid in caves, thickets, among the rocks, in pits and cisterns. They were just scrambling. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. They were just trying to get out of the way. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. So they were getting ready for this battle. And it says in verse 8, he waited seven days. And it says the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. Well, what happens is before they go to battle, they want the blessing of the seer, the man of God, the prophet. Samuel said, wait seven days, I'll be there. And uh, he would give the uh, blessing and have a sacrifice and all that, and then they'd go to war. And uh, this was something that only the prophets could do. Well, so, and that's why they had to wait. They had to wait for the prophets. Uh, in verse uh, 8, he waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but, saw, uh, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So Saul was getting worried because his guys were bailing on him. <clears throat> so he, Saul, said, okay, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. This is a big risk. As we're going to see. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished, verse 10, making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. And verse 11 says, what have you done? And this was, Saul crossed the line. Kings, you just did not do this. Nobody did the sacrifice but the prophet. This was a serious, serious no-no. Uh, Samuel said, what have you done? Saul replied, well, when I saw the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time, and the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I freaked and thought, now the Philistines will come down against me and kill God. And, and I have not sought the Lord's favor yet. We haven't gotten our sacrifice. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. He felt compelled. He knew it was wrong, but he felt compelled. Why? Because of the situation around him, the physical situation around him, as he saw it with his physical eyes. <clears throat> Samuel said in verse 13, you have done a foolish thing. 
you have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. This next part is amazing. If, if sets a condition, if you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. Wow. That means that uh, <clears throat> David was not God's plan A. Saul was. If Saul would have followed the rule, followed the command, followed his his uh, direction correctly, his directions correctly, it says here that the Lord would have uh, basically, where is it? Set, he would have established his kingdom over Israel forever. Forever. That's amazing. David was plan B. We would have never known about David if uh, Saul wouldn't have done this. And then it says in verse 14, but now, because of your actions, uh, your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. David was plan B. But here's something really cool. David wasn't even born yet when this was statement was made by Samuel. Uh, God sought out this man for so long, knowing as he did that eventually David would be born and he would be, I mean, in God's foreknowledge, he could see a little farther down the road and he knew that there was going to be a man who would be uh, thinking after his own heart that he would have the heart of God and he was going to make him the new king. But he hadn't even been born yet. This was eight years before David was even born. That is just amazing. So then for about eight years, this went on. Uh, says it. Uh, what do we see here? Let's see. About Samuel, your kingdom will not endure. And verse 15, then Samuel left Gilgal and went up to you. Gibeah and Benjamin and Saul counted the men who were there and they were number 600. And so uh, during this time, Saul loses the spirit of God that was on him. He starts uh, being, uh, what do you call it, oppressed by an evil spirit from the Lord. That's Old Testament. Uh, and he was... Uh, conflicted by this thing and so eventually David is born and then he uh, uh, but Samuel if you read the chapters before this I think starting in verse in chapter 9 Samuel was uh, all all in on Saul uh, he Saul had lost or Saul's uh, father had lost some sheep or goats or something a whole bunch of them and uh, Saul went out looking for them nobody could find them Saul said let's go see the prophet Samuel get some help so he actually inquired he did the obvious right thing went to Samuel Samuel was impressed with this guy and when it came time to make him king and anoint him as the the king Saul or Samuel was all in he really liked Saul and now Saul had had done this thing and his kingdom was going to be taken away from him and this really hurt Samuel it says that Samuel prayed uh, for a long time for Saul and if you pick up Let's see, where do we want to go from here? We want to go to, if I can find the notes.
Oh yeah, about this plan B thing. Uh, we know from the Old Testament, or we know from the Bible that the Old Testament was the uh, written rule book, so to speak, for Jesus. It was his textbook for life, as it is the, life, the textbook for all life, for all of us. But in particular, the Old Testament was for Jesus so that he would know who he was, what he was supposed to do because of who he was, and what he would receive if he did what he was supposed to do because of who he was. All these things about David, he would have learned, he would have read all of this, he would have seen that David was plan B. Yeah. And who else was plan B? Jesus. Yeah, he was the last Adam. He was plan B. Plan A was the first Adam. First Adam blew it. Plan A went out the window. And look how good uh, it turned out with, with David, who was plan B. Israel nation flourished, expanded. Uh, all kinds of good things happened with David as king. He was such a good king that and when you read in Kings and Chronicles, all about the other kings that followed, they're all compared to David. They're all, you know, their heart is compared to, he had the heart of his father David, or he didn't have the same heart as his father David. They're all compared to David. David is mentioned in the Bible just as many times as Jesus is. Over 900 times <laughs> the word David occurs. So David is in the Bible a lot. Uh, he made a big impact. And we can make a big impact just as well because we have all these scriptures and this wonderful word and this knowledge given to us. And the impact that we can make as we have the heart of God and we are seeking to follow the heart of God, we can make a big impact too, just like David did, just like G Jesus did. The works that he did and greater works can we do. Uh, so it's really cool that the, what the heart of a person can do. Uh, just totally awesome. And... Uh, Chapter 16 of 1 Samuel. Now let's pick up the record. Let's see. Let's go to chapter 17. Chapter 17. Chapter 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled. Uh, at this place, Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. And the Philistines were occupying on one hill and the Israelites were on the other side and in between was this big valley. So, and then verse 4, a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the camp. His height was six cubits in a span. Uh, the smallest there's a lot of debate as to how how tall he actually was, but the smallest that most people uh, have come up with is nine feet six inches. So it's anywhere between nine feet six inches and 12, 13 feet, anywhere in there, somewhere in that range. He was really tall. He was really big, and he's really bad. And uh, he had all this armor on. He was, I mean, uh, it was amazing. Uh, he had all this armor on. His, he had a bronze helmet. He had stuff on his, he just had armor all over him. And his shield bearer uh, went ahead of him. I don't know why he would need a shield bearer. The guy probably, uh, probably needed more than one, I would think, to hold up all that stuff. But anyways, verse 8 says that this guy Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and uh, gave him an ultimatum. He says, why don't you just come out? Why do you all just come out and line up for battle? I mean, this is silly. 
Am I not a Philistine? And are you not all servants of Saul? Choose you. I've got an idea. He's got this idea. Hey, choose a man and have him come down to me. And if he's able to fight and kill me, we'll all become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. He thought he, this, they thought this was just, you know, a no-brainer for a Philistine from a five senses point of view. I mean, he was head, shoulders, and waist above every other man. A six-foot man would come up to his waist, probably. Just crazy. Uh, if that. This day, in verse 10, it says, And then he said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. And on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. They were all looking at the situation with their five senses. Then comes verse 12. Now David was the son of Jesse, and he was from Bethlehem. Very cool. Jesus was born there. Uh, and Jesse had eight sons. And in Saul's time, he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war. Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah. David was the youngest. He was the runt of the litter, literally. When Samuel came, a little bit before this, Samuel came, a couple years before this, Samuel came, and God told Samuel, says, uh, how long are you going to mourn for, for Saul? He says, fill your horn with oil and get up and go to uh, Bethlehem, find this Jesse guy, and I'm going to... Uh, find me a king, a man after my own heart. And so Jesse has this meeting with Samuel. Samuel says, bring your sons so that I can uh, choose the one who's going to be the new king. And this was all done in secret. Saul didn't know anything about this. And uh, uh, so the first one brought by is the firstborn. That's uh, Eliab. And he's probably really big, really tall, a a lot like Saul, even though Saul was taller than everybody. But he was probably, he was the oldest. He's probably the strongest and the most uh, valiant man of the group. And so when he came before Sam, he says, certainly this must be him. And God said, nope. And so then he goes, oh, okay. So he went, goes down the line to the next one. And this must be the one. And God says, nope. And he goes through the whole line, all seven of them. And on the last one, God says, nope, that's not him. He goes through all seven of them. And, go, and here's the really cool part about Samuel. He had the wherewithal. He was so tight with God. This is cool. He was so tight with God that he didn't feel obligated to choose one of these guys. He said, there must be another one. There's got to be more. And so he so he asked Jesse, he says, are these all your sons? And Jesse goes, well, no. <laughs> and that's probably how he said it, too. Oh, well, no, I've got one more. He's the youngest. He's, he's out in the field. He's just keeping the sheep. And so Samuel knew that was him. He knew it. And he knew that David, being the runt of the family, was not getting any respect, no honor. And he didn't get any honor was obvious because his father didn't even think he was worthy enough to even come to the meeting. It's, it's uh, amazing uh, the attitude that the family had towards David. And this is kind of an indication. And so Samuel turned it all around. He says, we're not going to sit down. We're going to keep standing right here. We're not, nobody's going to sit down until somebody brings uh, David to this meeting. He's out watching the sheep. These guys are all going to stand right here with Samuel and wait for somebody to get David to this meeting. You talk about a little honor and a little respect. Uh, that's what Samuel had for David and uh, at God's bequest, no doubt. He didn't say these things lightly. 
And this, I think, comes back later because I think Eliab uh, falsely accuses David of, of uh, doing things and leaving the sheep behind and all this. So we pick up the story now here in verse 17. So Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah or this roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread and go uh, check on your brothers. Uh, give some of these uh, to the their unit commander and then bring back some news about them. Verse 19, there was Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. So David goes, oh yeah, oh yeah, okay, I'll go, I'll go. Early in the morning, verse 20, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd. He didn't leave him out there unattended. He took care of his, his responsibility, was the sheep. He made sure they were being cared for. Loaded up and set out as who directed his father. Okay. He reached the camp and his, the army was going out to its battle positions. Shouting the war cry, Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other, getting ready for battle. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and asked his brothers how they were. I mean, this is just amazing. <laughs> just, if you can picture this in a movie, they're all getting ready to go to battle, and here comes little David, the run of the little, the little mama's boy, so to speak. He was all ready and, you know, very... Fair complexion, very nice. He's probably a little pretty boy. And he's out there running to the battle line to say, hey, big brother. Hey, Eli, what's going? What's happening? What's going? How are we going? How's the war going? And it's just, it's crazy. It makes no sense. But that's what he did. And uh, uh, verse 22, David left his things. Verse 23, as he was talking with them, Goliath the Philistine, champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear, and this, no doubt, made them all scatter again. Verse 25, now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? I mean, the talk. All these guys are just talking now. Oh, my gosh. Did you see that? Oh, gee. What a play. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. It's just like Sunday NFL uh, quarterback coach, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And the king, the king will give great wealth. Did you know the king will give great wealth to the man who kills this guy? He'll also give him his daughter in marriage and exempt his family from taxes. And, you know, on and on, David says uh, to the guy standing there, what, what did you say? What will be done for the man who kills the Philistine? And he said all this. And David said, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and moves this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And they repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, yeah, this is what it will be like. And then Eliab, his brother, heard him speaking with the men. And... And he, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? You know, belittling the guy in front of all these other uh, soldiers and stuff. I know how conceited you are, all lies, and how wicked your heart is, another lie. You came down here and watched the battle. Wrong. He was doing what his father Ask him to do. All right. But what was his response? David said, now what have I done? Can't I even speak? And uh, King James says, uh, let's see, verse 29. It's really cool in the King James. Let's read it here real quick. King James 17. Uh, what is it? 29, 30. Oh, 29, yes. Okay, 29. And David said, What have I done? Is there not a cause? Like, duh, it's like, 
don't you know what's going on? He says, and so David doesn't even go there. It's like, ah, hello? And he doesn't even try to say, I'm doing what my dad asked me to do. I am not conceited. I don't have an evil heart. I didn't come here to do all those things you said. You know, he didn't have to face the criticism. He just said, is there not a cause here? And he turned away. And uh, then in verse 30, he turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the man answered him as before. What David said was overheard and then reported to Saul. And Saul sent for him. Now Saul knew who he was because David had been playing his harp for him, making him feel better. When the evil spirit would come, he would send for David. David would play his harp and he'd feel better. So David wasn't a total stranger to Saul. But Saul did not know that David was anointed. Uh, and so when David came and, and to Saul, David said to Saul, let no one lose. Lo the first thing David says, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant, he doesn't, he doesn't say I, he says your servant will go and fight for him, or and go and fight him. Saul replied, you're not able. See, Saul's look, David's looking at this from the spiritual point of view, that uncircumcised Philistine, you know. He, in other words, he's not under the covenant. He doesn't have God on his side like we do, you know. If God be for us, who can be against us? From David's point of view, the the Philistine was at a serious disadvantage. It's awesome point of view. Uh, and uh, Saul said, well, that's nice, but in verse 34, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a, or Saul said, uh, verse 33, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight. I appreciate what you're doing, but you're only a young man, and he's been a warrior from his youth, and you're only a youth. But David said to Saul, hey, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair struck it and killed it your servant has killed both the lion and the bear this uncircumcised philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living god the lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this philistine whoa that is um holy spirit talking there in David. Very cool stuff. But he was motivated because this guy had disgraced and defied his God. And it was no different than David going out there and he's protecting his flock, his sheep, and the enemy comes. In this case, it was a lion, and in another case, it was a bear. And he, they took one of those sheep. Did David let it go? No. Do you remember? Do, do you remember reading in the Gospels something that Jesus did or said about the ninety and nine sheep? Now one was lost, and he left the ninety nine and went after the one. Yeah, he's probably thinking about David. Very cool stuff here. Uh, David uh, then goes up and defeats the Philistine, hits him with the sling. Uh, all of this, uh, probably a lot of God working in here, not probably, but with the uh, Holy Spirit that David had on him, directing his every th toss with the rock and the sling and the stone and all that picked up all those smooth stones and went into battle. Saul gave him all his armor. Uh, 
David said, can't use it, haven't been, hasn't been tried. David knew about the, uh, his ability against the, the lion and the bear, and he would use that same ability uh, against the Philistine. And we all know that he killed the Philistine, and things turned around, and that was the beginning of David's uh, notoriety. Uh, David was a very humble guy. He was a very behind-the-scenes guy. He practiced in that field. Nobody was watching him. He probably rehearsed many of the psalms that he wrote later while he was out in that field. He was a man after God's own heart. He thought about those things, about the things of God. Uh, his ancestors, Abraham, all those guys, he's probably thinking about all those things, how God delivered them. Uh, Caleb, all those guys, all the judges, he's probably pondered all those things, meditated on them all the time. He knew he was anointed. He knew he had the power of, of Holy Spirit on him, uh, which gave him uh, the ability and power and authority to, to protect his sheep, the things that he was responsible for. And uh, in, in much the same way that he defied the Philistine, we can defy those things that we can fight and go after knowing that we can win against those things that are fighting against us. Cancer, disease, uh, the, the head cold, uh, all these, anything that has a name, Jesus has a name above all names, even diseases, even sickness. These things are not a big deal when it comes to God. Uh, we just need to start having the heart of David, walking out on that heart just like he had in the heart of God, knowing the promises that we have in the Word, and seeing how the Spirit moved in the Old Testament among these guys, like David, uh, Elijah, Joseph, uh, Abraham, these guys. These guys are great examples. And the examples of David here, we've just touched on a few of them. There's many, many more. David was an awesome guy. Uh, he, he did many good things. He did a few bad things. And because of those things, he suffered. He suffered greatly. And we can learn from that. We don't have to go through the school of hard knocks. We've got a, the textbook of life. It's right here. And a lot of this learning is from the Old Testament. And Jesus read the Old Testament just like we're doing it. And he was able to put that scripture together, together knowing it was about him. A lot of this was about him. David wrote a lot of psalms about, about his Lord and uh, the coming of the Messiah. And uh, good, good, good stuff. David was an awesome guy, and uh, it is really cool to be able to, to have these scriptures in writing, the Word of God in writing, so that we can go to it when we need to know things, and we can learn from these scriptures how, and how to apply these things in our everyday life so that we can be more than a conqueror, so that we can be prosperous in every situation, so that we can be successful in resisting the devil in every situation. And so hopefully this will encourage you to check out some more of these things that David did. Uh, it's all in Samuel, First and Second Samuel. I think there's some more in the Kings, maybe the Chronicles. It's all in that section right there. David wrote... Uh, most of the Psalms, that puts him right up there in the top two or three as far as uh, people who wrote scripture. Uh, it may have only been one book, but it's a big one. <laughs> I think uh, it's almost as big as the first five books of the Bible. Almost. There's 150 Psalms. I think there's like 200 chapters in the first Maybe a little bit more than that in the first five books of the Bible. So he's right up there. And God worked mightily in his life, and we can learn from him.
So, Father, I thank you for your word that you put it in writing so that we could learn and not be ignorant of all these things and how we can apply them in our lives today so that we can be successful just like David was. And we're, we love you. We thank, thank you for all this. And uh, we praise you every day, and every minute of every day, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you.